It builds upon previous work by the National AIDS Trust, including our work to end NHS Digital's abhorrent practice of sharing information um, sourced from health records with the Home Office for the purpose of immigration tech tracing and our 2019 guidance for staff working in immigration removal centres to ensure people living with HIV have the best possible care and our campaigning to increase access to HIV testing for people in initial accommodation. I'm really, really delighted that we're joined by an amazing panel of experts today to discuss the report findings and recommendations. And so how this is gonna work is, uh, in a minute, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Tamara Manuel, who is the author of the report. And after she's spoken, each member of the panel, I'll introduce each member of the panel in turn, um, and they'll each respond for around five minutes. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A and a discussion among the panel, and we'll invite questions from you, the audience, that I can't see, but I know that you're there. Um, so just a couple of ground rules. Uh, I don't know if everybody watching just got the same weird American announcement that came up over my screen, but if you didn't, uh, we're recording this webinar. Uh, but to reassure you, because it's a webinar, you'll all know none of your faces are on camera. So what, it's, what we're recording is kind of what you're seeing. Um, if you do have a question for the panel, can I uh, beg you to please put it in the Q&A and not the chat? So it's absolutely fine for you to share your comments and your thoughts in the chat, but we won't be monitoring that for questions for the panel. It just makes it much easier for us to kind of, for, well, for me to kind of work out what the questions are if you put them in the Q&A, and then I'll try and keep track of those and we'll get through as many of them as we can in the time that we have allotted. So uh, I'm, I'm proud of my own self, finishing on time, and um, I'm now really delighted to introduce Tamara Manuel, whose pronouns are she and her, and who's a policy and campaigns officer at National AIDS Trust, who leads on our work on migration, and she's the author of this report that we're launching today. And Tamara is going to share the key findings and the recommendations. So I'll hand you over to her now. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I've got some slides to share. Great, so um, in 2019, 62% of all new HIV diagnoses in the UK were among migrants. We wanted to understand the barriers that migrants face accessing HIV testing, treatment and care. And the HIV and Migration Report explores these barriers and makes recommendations to improve their health outcomes and quality of life. Um, so migrants living with HIV shaped this whole project. We employed three people living with HIV who were all born abroad and living um, as peer experts to be a part of our research team. And my colleague Jose will speak about that in more detail later on. The peer experts conducted in-depth interviews with 20, 22 people living with HIV who were all born abroad, as well as leading two focus groups. And we've ensured that there's a breadth and diversity among the people that we interviewed in terms of their immigration experiences, region of birth, gender, age, and sexual orientation. Our findings don't claim to be representative of all migrants affected by HIV in the UK, but they do highlight some key issues and barriers. So jumping into the findings from our research, in line with people living with HIV in the UK in general, the people we interviewed were really satisfied with the care they received from HIV clinical services. Participants did note a difference between HIV clinics and other areas of healthcare, with many reporting going to their HIV clinic and non -HIV, with non-HIV healthcare issues due to the trust they had in their clinicians and concerns about using other parts of the healthcare system. Participants were less positive about the care they'd received from other areas of healthcare, particularly general practice. Not all participants were registered with the GP. Some told us they were scared to register because they didn't want to have to answer questions about their immigration status or provide an address. Some told us they were concerned about the potential to be reported to immigration enforcement if they did try and register. But GP access is essential, in spite of some of the barriers to registering with the GP. Heterosexuals born abroad are more likely to be diagnosed at a GP than those born in the UK. And we've made a few recommendations based on improving access to GPs, including calling for a review of GP registration models and practice to understand why migrants face difficulties registering and accessing care at the GP. Among the people we interviewed, there was limited access to testing and a high rate of late diagnosis. So of the 13 interview participants who were diagnosed for the first time in the UK, eight were diagnosed late and six were diagnosed either in accident emergency or following referral to a sexual health clinic by another department after being treated for an indicated condition. All of the gay and bisexual men who were diagnosed with HIV for the first time in the UK were diagnosed in sexual health clinics and none were diagnosed late. 
Encouraging and facilitating migrants to proactively test for HIV reduces the likelihood that they'll be diagnosed late. It reduces their chances of mortality and ill health, and it makes it less likely that they'll, go, they'll pass the virus on. Which is why we recommend that when the NHS takes blood samples across all kinds of healthcare settings, there must be opt-out, not opt-in HIV testing, so the opportunities to test aren't missed. HIV support services play an essential role in supporting migrants living with HIV in the UK. The people we interviewed use support services for a wide variety of needs, often beyond HIV, including housing, financial hardship funds, help accessing benefits, immigration advice, and sexual health and relationship advice. Some participants also stress the importance and value of culturally specific HIV support provided in their first language, but cuts to local authority public health budgets and a lack of clear commissioning responsibility for HIV support services has resulted in a lack of adequate funding. We've made some recommendations on commissioning and funding to help ensure support services can meet the needs of people born abroad living with HIV. HIV treatment and care is free to everyone in the UK, regardless of immigration status. But despite this, hostile environment policies deter people from engaging with services that they're eligible for. Costs in other parts of the healthcare system leads to confusion around possible charges for NHS services, with people unclear about what they can and can't receive for free. And this is compounded by a lack of understanding among some healthcare providers, resulting in errors in implementation. The practice of data sharing between the NHS and the Home Office also led to many people we spoke to being scared to go to hospital because of the risk of being reported to immigration enforcement. And this reluctance to engage in services results in migrants being at risk of late HIV diagnosis and poorer health outcomes, which is why we recommend that healthcare staff should not be responsible for upholding hostile environment policies and that the practices of charging migrants for access to healthcare should be ended, and as, as well as data sharing between the NHS and Home Office. We found no evidence of HIV health tourism, which is sometimes used politically to challenge rights to healthcare for migrants. Among the people we spoke to, there was low or no awareness of what HIV care was available to migrants in the UK before they travelled. 61% of migrants diagnosed with HIV in 2019 were diagnosed for the first time in the UK, meaning they either didn't have or didn't know they had HIV when they arrived. And many migrants living with HIV acquired it after arrival in the UK. Between 2009 and 2018, it's estimated that over half of the people born abroad diagnosed with HIV probably acquired it here. Even among those previously diagnosed abroad though, there was no evidence to suggest that their intention for migrating was to receive HIV treatment. And data from Public Health England shows that in 2018, over a third of migrants born and previously diagnosed abroad didn't access care within one year of their arrival in the UK, and nearly half were diagnosed late when they did. But our findings and recommendations also extend beyond HIV alone, and we need to consider the wider healthcare and socioeconomic barriers that migrants face in the UK if we're going to be successful in improving their health outcomes. Many people we interviewed spoke about how hard it had been to find information about access to HIV testing, treatment and care. Most people said that they used the internet for information, but reported it was tricky finding reliable sources, especially as some said their level of English wasn't so good when they first arrived. But since everyone moving to the UK has to interact in some form with the immigration system, we recommend that the Home Office and the Department of Health and Social Care proactively provide information on HIV testing and treatment entitlements to all migrants applying for a visa, asylum or reporting to the Home Office. And it's crucial that this includes information on how, health, how the healthcare system works, how to register with a GP, and it must be available in key languages and provide information about interpretation services too. Poverty forces people into situations more likely to put them at risk of acquiring HIV, and it makes it harder for them to engage with care and access effective treatment once they are diagnosed. A quarter of the people we interviewed had experienced homelessness since arriving in the UK and a quarter of all participants were not working at the time of interview because they didn't have the right to work. Also, many migrants subject to immigration control have no recourse to public funds, and this means they have no entitlement to, them, to most welfare benefits, which pushes them further into poverty. This severe financial insecurity can also mean that migrants are forced into transactional relationships, exchanging sex for accommodation or immigration status, and this makes people even more vulnerable to harm, such as domestic violence, including coercive control. And our report recommends that the Health and Social Care Committee investigate the health and economic impacts of the current lack of permission to work and no recourse to public funds policy on individual and public health. We know that people living with HIV are more likely to have poor mental health. Concerns around immigration status, racism, HIV stigma and financial insecurity compound this. 
and most participants reported struggling with their mental health since arriving in the UK. Some participants reported that they stopped taking their medication when suffering with bad mental health, including suicidal thoughts. And many said that public perceptions of migrants and of people living with HIV had made them feel alone, but that they'd found it very difficult to access psychological support on the NHS. Our report recommends that commissioners ensure that there is access to mental health services that can meet the specific needs of migrants living with HIV. And finally, we also found that COVID-19 has impacted access to services and support. As well as concerns about long-term financial insecurity, almost all participants had reported feeling lonely since arriving in the UK. And the lack of face-to-face -face peer support during the pandemic has exacerbated this for some. For this reason, we recommend that HIV clinics and support services must maintain a mix of online and face-to-face -face services beyond the pandemic to ensure that marginalised populations, including migrants, are able to access testing, treatment and support. So that's an overview of the findings of our research and a handful of the recommendations that we've made. And a full list of the recommendations can be found on pages six to eight of the report. And the recommendations are aimed at various bodies, including the Home Office, the Department of Health and Social Care and clinical commissioning groups. And we're looking forward to working with them to implement the recommendations and improve the quality of life of migrants living with or at risk of HIV in the UK. Thank you. I'll try that again without being on mute. Thank you so much, Tamara. That was great. And I'm now really pleased to be able to invite our panel in, in order to kind of respond with their thoughts, um, I, just for around five minutes to get us started before we can kind of have a conversation involving questions from the audience. So I'm absolutely delighted that our first speaker is Florence Eshalomi, whose pronouns are she, her, and who's been the MP for Vauxhall since 2019 and is vice chair of the APPG on HIV and AIDS. And prior to be elected as an MP, Florence was a councillor for Lambeth and public affairs manager at the Runnymede Trust, as well as being a member of the London Assembly. As an MP, Florence has spoken up on migrants' rights, health inequalities, and she's shown support for a national HIV strategy. So I'm delighted to hand over to Florence. Thank you very much, Deborah. And again, I'll remember to unmute myself. Um, I'm pleased to join you all this afternoon and as you all know this month marks 40 years since the first reported case of AIDS and subsequent discovery of HIV. The HIV endemic continues to devastate lives across the world but we have made big progress in the UK since those dark days way back in the 80s. New cases of HIV have fallen by a third in the last five years and diagnosis amongst gay and bisexual men is nearly hard. And the big advances in HIV treatment now mean that the majority of people living with HIV can now expect normal life expectancy. And those on effective treatment can't pass it on. You know, we have to repeat that. You can't pass it on. I'm really proud to represent Vauxhall, my home seat. And it's a constituency with a large migrant community and one of the highest rates of prevalence of HIV in the country. And the fantastic research by the National AIDS Trust has focused on London, and it's gonna be so relevant to my constituents. I also welcome this timely report and its findings. And we need to look at how we must respond to the unmet needs of people living abroad with or at risk of HIV in the UK. Since the discovery of HIV four decades ago, it's been largely seen through the prism of white lenses but we know that HIV disproportionately affects black, Asian and ethnic minority communities. The whitewashing of the epidemic helps explain why today, even as new HIV diagnoses decline across the UK, progress is not equal in terms of reducing transmission across the board. Almost half of new HIV diagnoses amongst heterosexuals in the UK are amongst black African men and women despite the fact that they only make up 2% of the British population. And we know that these communities are less likely to access the anti-HIV drug PrEP, which after so many years of campaigning of, of, of people on this call and some of the people participating, it has finally become routinely available. We can't address HIV without reaching every community. We need a whole community response. And we need to look at targeted investment for people born abroad and those living in the UK. I'm proud that today we are celebrating Windrush Day and we pay tribute to the migrants from the Caribbean and right across the Commonwealth who arrived in the UK 73 years ago today 
to help rebuild Britain after the war. But let's face it, we've seen a hostile environment from the Windrush scandal, and that's a direct correlation of this government's policies. It's been implemented to cause harm to people living abroad and deterring them from accessing healthcare, including HIV testing and treatment. And this report demonstrates through personal testimonies how these policies are stopping people prevent from accessing preventative healthcare, including HIV testing and treatment. And this is something that I'm really quite worried about as an MP in a South London, in, a, in the London constituency. I've seen firsthand the impact of the policy of no recourse to public funds has had on my constituents. And I'm a proud supporter of the Lambeth Patients Not Passports campaign. In March last year, I signed a letter urging the government to temporarily remove the no recourse to public funds conditions, which affects so many migrants. The Home Office has to end the no recourse to public funds policy and conduct an urgent review to assess the impact on this individual and public health approach. I've called for the government as the vice chair of the all party parliamentary group on HIV and AIDS with the National AIDS Trust, Terence Higgins Trust and the Elton John Foundation to ensure that England has an HIV action plan to deliver on this commitment of no new HIV transmissions by 2030, we can do it. But if we're really truly to meet that target, migrants need to be part of that focus group and they need to be given support to help make sure that action plan works. We cannot end HIV transmissions in the UK without by leaving any group behind. And ending that tr transmission by 2030 has to be a global effort. So that's why I was really concerned by the government's decision to cut funding for UN AIDS by 80% this year, 80%. We all know too well that pandemics can only be beaten by global effort. And despite the significant progress, AIDS remains one of the causes, main causes of death of women in productive ages. And 1.7 million people acquired HIV across the world last year. 690 people lost their lives to age-related illnesses. We've seen the impact of COVID-19, and I'm scared that that's going to now reverse some of the progress we've made in the, in, in the last few years. And this report again highlights the impact of migrants living with HIV and the added impact of COVID-19. They're scared to access healthcare. They're scared to engage with their GP surgery. They're excluded, they're marginalized. So I think it's really important that we saw an effort by the Mayor of London just last weekend, calling people from across London, regardless of your immigration status, to come forward and get vaccinated. The same way we can't beat HIV and AIDS without treating everybody, we won't beat COVID without treating everybody. Everybody needs access to that vaccine. So we need to make sure that we continue to redouble our efforts on pushing the government for an urgent response to HIV. The government must ensure that access for key services, especially those excluded groups, such as migrants, is prioritized so that no one is left out. This report also lays out the groundwork for some of the collective work, and it's really important that all of us continue to be focused on this. I'll continue to do my bit as one of the MPs representing a diverse constituency, and I look forward to the discussions later on this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Florence, for those words. Um, and I'm now really delighted to hand over to Jose Mejia, whose pronouns are he and him. And Jose is a peer expert, a National AIDS Trust, and a member of the research team for this project. And in his other life, Jose is an HIV peer support manager at the Metro Charity. Thank you, Deborah, for, for the introduction. And thanks, Florence. As, as one of your constituents, it's great to hear you speak so clearly and passionately about uh, well, this matter that is so close to my heart. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my, my own personal experience uh, living with HIV in the UK and, and the importance of involving migrants in, in health research and, and, and in HIV work in general. So first, I'm a 35-year-old gay man. I'm from Colombia, and I've been in the UK since 2008. And throughout these six years, I, I feel that I've struggled to navigate the healthcare system. I've had issues navigating the healthcare system, even when 
I don't have a, a language barrier to do so, but it's still been a confusing process to to get what I need out of the out of the NHS and the healthcare system. Uh, I had before coming here in, in 2008, I had no prior knowledge of what my HIV care entitlements were. I didn't know, uh, yeah, what I could access or could not access. And that meant I traveled with six months of medication in my suitcases and a health, a printed healthcare record from from my from well from Colombia, which is but it's clearly something that yeah shouldn't be happening or I, I shouldn't have to do, but but I did because I had no knowledge. Uh, and I think some of the other things that have happened is I've experienced uh, stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings, where that is sort of uh, in dental surgeries or in GP practices. And this goes a range of from, from sort of inappropriate questioning to, to stigmatizing behaviors. Uh, I think the, the other thing important to talk about is mental health. And I think some of the unfair narratives about migrants and and about people living with HIV have had a profound impact on, on, on my emotional well-being. And, and that has meant that at times I've struggled with, 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 with my mental health or my emotional well-being. And, and I've had to access forms of, of support to, to deal with that. And, and it has usually not been very easy, becoming a sort of added burden to, to, to my well-being. So it's usually hard to find. It's difficult to access. There are waiting lists. It's short term and, and it can be restricted. Uh, and, and lastly, I think paying increasing visa fees and, and health surcharges have meant that I have to miss out on other things and, and have somehow remained uh, in a way economically and socially excluded because of that. So, so I think that's important to acknowledge. And that's kind of what led me to, to, to doing uh, work on HIV and, and, and specifically working with migrants living with HIV. So, so I think the, the, the importance of involving migrants in, in, in or, or at least with this project, one of the key things was that the peer element of this research project was key in facilitating the engagement and involvement of migrants and cre creating that sort of safe space and safe and confidential space for them to talk about their experiences. And, and I think if, if we want to, to really achieve the targets in, in, two, in 2030 of, of ending new HIV transmissions, then we really need to, to work with migrants and involve migrants uh, in this key work and, and at all levels, both in health and in social care work. So I think migrant involvement is, is key around the world, but it's key specifically in a city as diverse as London. And, and yeah, it's, and it's specifically key in, in HIV work when we know that, that HIV disproportionately affects migrants. Uh, and, and I think for me being part of this, of this research project was something that was very important. I really wanted to, wanted to be part of this project and it was an opportunity, one of, of, of exploring my own identity as, as a migrant living with HIV, but it was also an opportunity to better understand the, the, how diverse the community of migrants living with HIV is and to understand the barriers, challenges and, and successes that we've faced as a community beyond my own personal experience. Uh, and, and it felt or it feels like this is a great opportunity to influence policy and, and system wide change and hopefully that will come with with improving uh, the experiences of new coming migrants living with HIV into the UK so I really hope that 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 happens and and I think just just thinking ahead and uh, on what to do or what else can we do to to further involve migrants in, in implementing the recommendations of this report or in doing further migrant activism. activism I think one, uh, this is a really exciting time to, to work on, on migrant involvement in access to health. Uh, it, it's a really great opportunity to know who, who we are and what our experiences have been and to understand some of our needs and desires to create some awareness on, on the size and, 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 and the diversity of the community. And, and particularly to to involve us or to involve migrants in general, but yeah, to involve us in 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 co-production of of workshops that 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 then lead or result in future HIV campaigns, research, work, and activism. It's ideal that we are part of the whole process and that we are there since the beginning. And yeah, I think the the other thing is hopefully we'll get to share these recommendations with everyone in the call and with more and more people who can help us sort of use or who can use these recommendations to, to push for change, but also to empower migrants to, if possible, and if they can, to, to share their stories so that, so that 
their stories are heard and, and, and help us achieve the change that, that we are looking for. I think it's important that we build a coalition of migrants living with HIV and, and, that, and that we connect, whether that it's through online platforms or, or hopefully at some point in person, uh, but that we connect uh, migrants living with HIV, not only in London, but around the world, because, because this is a global issue and we need to be connected and to understand the challenges that migrants faced all around the, the world, the country and the world. Uh, yeah, and, and hopefully these recommendations will encourage uh, HIV support organizations to actively develop tailored services that, that benefit migrant communities and that, and when possible, that these services are remunerated. Uh, so, so yeah, I think there's there's just a lot of we we just hope that this sort of starts a lot of initiatives and frameworks that facilitate and encourage migrant activism uh, without sort of all the, the the requirements and conditions that sometimes come with it. So that that it's an easier process for for us to engage with. Uh, yeah, and that's me. Thank you so much Jose uh, that gave me lots to think about just in that I was scribbling down questions I'm going to come back to you with later on but thank you so much I'm going to move on now um, and introduce Dr Raghashri Darawan whose pronouns are she her and Raghashri is a consultant in sexual health and HIV medicine at Bart's Health NHS Trust and an honorary senior lecturer at Queen Mary University of London she co she's the co-founder of Saha, which is the South Asian HIV advisory resource, and a trustee of SWIFT, supporting women with HIV information network, and Beaver. Um, and Raghashree is a member of the advisory group for this project. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so as, as Debbie said, I'm an HIV consultant working in East London, um, and I've been very privileged to treat many people over the years. Uh, living with HIV who've been, brought, who've been born abroad and to hear their stories and I think you know as HIV clinicians I think we know the statistics very well um, we know that many people living with HIV in the UK are migrants that they're more likely to present late and that they may face barriers to staying in treatment and on care and in care on treatment and in care um, so essentially we know the who and the what but what this important report does is tell us the why and the how so the ways in which migrants may disproportionately experience worse HIV outcomes than other groups. And I think importantly, we also get to hear their lived experiences, which are seldom heard. So huge thanks to NAT and the team for delivering this report. So I think um, as an HIV physician, there are several findings that strike me. I think firstly, the importance of education and making information on how the NHS works and on entitlements to care available to migrants in an accessible way. And I think HIV services can help with this. And I think it's first of all important that we educate ourselves so that we can give the right information um, to our patients. And it's important that we make HIV prevention and treatment services accessible to all. So making sure we have information in different languages, using interpreters and referring to the right HIV support organizations and having pathways to them. And I just really want to emphasize that HIV support organizations are so important and they help migrants in so many different ways. For example, helping them to navigate healthcare systems, such as going along with people to help them register with their GP, giving advice around finances, welfare, housing, and the immigration process. And we also know that migrants may also experience prejudice and discrimination on many levels. So due to their migrant status, the color of their skin, their HIV status, and this can leave people feeling isolated. The peer support that HIV organizations provide help combat this loneliness and help individuals join up with communities. And I think it's really important that HIV organizations continue to be funded. I think another um, finding that struck me was around the effects of poverty and destitution. Um, and we see this all the time. So we know that many migrants are highly skilled with professional qualifications in their home countries, but due to restrictions on employment, they're not able to work. And this has a huge impact on mental health and self-esteem. And I've often referred migrants to our in-house psychology team, but sometimes think about whether if they were able to do the work that they, they're trained to do, and the work paid them a living wage, whether they would need this mental health support. And of course, poverty is also linked to poor HIV outcomes. So it means that sometimes people can't afford to get transport to come into clinic. They may not be able to buy the food they need to take um, with their medications. And it means that HIV is just one of many competing issues in their lives. And this can have long-term impacts on not only their HIV outcomes, but also their general health and well-being. 
And thirdly, um, the hostile environment policies. Um, so patients may avoid coming to their HIV clinic for fear of being reported to immigration authorities or having their data shared. And this means that without treatment, their HIV progresses and they end up presenting to healthcare as an emergency with life-threatening AIDS-defining diagnoses. And this may also occur if they're diagnosed late, having not been able to access services which offer HIV prevention or testing. Fear of the hostile environment may also engender mistrust between us and our patients, and this can negatively impact on how patients experience care. And we've seen how important mistrust is recently, um, for example, with encouraging COVID vaccine uptake. I think by working with communities, developing relationships and building trust, we can improve health outcomes at an individual and at a public health level. And as a clinician, I'm aware that many of the factors that affect a person's health are determined before they enter healthcare services. So the social determinants of health. And I think this is even more important when we think about migrants who are more likely to experience social and economic adversity. Health is a human right, and we must do everything we can to ensure that migrants have this right. And this is a moral argument as well as one of public health and economics. So um, finally, just to say, I really welcome this report and the recommendations, and I really hope they'll be acted on. Huge thanks to NAT for the opportunity to help advise on, on the report, and I look forward to hearing what the rest of the panel panelists say. Thank you so much. Uh... Each time another person speaks, I kind of I have I have more things that I'm scribbling down, but we, we are un, not unexpectedly running a little bit late. So I'm going to just kind of move us along, uh, but just take this quick moment to remind people um, if you have questions that you're thinking of, if you can get them in a Q&A now as we're kind of listening to speakers, that will be super helpful uh, for us to get the conversation going once we hear from our last two speakers. But first of all, I'm really happy to introduce Dennis Onyango, whose pronouns are he, him, and who's a programs director at the Africa Advocacy Foundation. Dennis is involved in healthcare policy work at a national and international level. Um, he knows many of you on this call um, and he served on all kinds of advisory boards, including the work, the WHO Regional Coordinating Committee on HIV, Hepatitis and TB and the Impact Trial CAB on PrEP. And so I'm very delighted to hand over to Dennis. Uh, thank you Debs, uh, for, for the invitation and thanks to my panelists uh, uh, for very, very insightful uh, contributions. Um, welcome this report. I was actually just telling uh, Sean and Tamara yesterday that I think is very timely because we haven't had, um, you know, any report that has actually looked in depth at issues that migrants experience. And, um, you know, you know, you just have to start by asking yourselves, why is it that it's taking so long to sort some of the very obvious things that should be solved? Why do we continue having a hostile environment policy, even as we say, that migrants can access uh, free testing and treatment for infectious diseases. Why, why, do we, why are we seeing so many late HIV diagnoses and actually diagnosis happening in emergency settings? Uh, why are we seeing still um, you know, stigma persisting in our communities? Uh, and I think it's largely really to do with um, the system, the way it is up, set up in many respects. Uh, very many unconscious biases, but I also think that there is um, a lot of, um, you know, uh, negative attitudes towards migrants really and a lack of consideration as to migrants the value of migrants or people who are, my, who are, who are not born you know or, uh, in the UK uh, uh, or in Europe for that matter you know originally so I, I think that there are lots of things that need to be done I think that uh, you know we need to look at very very practical issues like if somebody is diagnosed with HIV what I mean in a community setting for example in a pop-up pop clinic why is this such a difficult thing to get them started on treatment simply because they don't have a GP? So we need to think about service reorganization to ensure that we do not let people fall through the cracks. I, at the moment, there's a lot of concerted effort to get people who have been lost to care to come back to re-engage with care. And I think that's largely to do with how our systems operate because if people were comfortable accessing services, being supported through care, they wouldn't disappear, you know? They wouldn't disappear. And so I think that there are a lot of intersections around how services um, are set up. I think that uh, you know it's, it's, it's taken massively, massively long time to recognize even the impact of mental health on people who are living with HIV, for example. Uh, you know, it's really difficult to say that you are uh, you know, providing free access in theory for infectious diseases. And uh, at the same time, you know, you are not, uh, you know, you are not 
treating conditions that are related to HIV. So I think that all these things need to be looked at. Uh, in terms of uh, peer support, we know very well that people with lived experience of peer support provide best support to their, their, their peers. And I don't think that enough prioritization has been given to how peer support is commissioned. I think that we need to go back to the drawing board and as Jose said earlier, do a bit of co-production so that we can actually do work together. But I also think that uh, in terms of stigma, it's quite challenging because um, you know we've been just working as part of the first track cities to try and find the right definition of internalized stigma and this general acceptance that is actually you know experiences from around the community and I can equate this uh, you know to football for example where they say um, not very many gay footballers are coming out about their sexualities because of the toxic environment under which they are and I think that's largely you know not not exactly the same but actually almost the same with HIV because you know we are we live in communities that are highly stigmatized and that drives people further and further and so I think that um, you know we need to be able to think about a lot of things how we set up services why is it that somebody diagnosed with HIV in Manchester calls us down here to provide that support without consideration as to the networks of that person or the environment? So I think all this needs to be looked at. And finally, I think that we need to look at how services are commissioned. Peer support, I am afraid to say, hasn't been given priority. Uh, supporting migrant communities hasn't been, been given priority. And I'm not saying this because migrants are unique, but just because they are starting late. We are coming to Europe, you know, used to some sort of different types of services where services sometimes come to us as pop-up and yet we expected to go and do, you know, visit, uh, you know, clinical settings. And so you see experience tells us that when you do some of these interventions in the community, people actually access them. So we need to be able to think about how we shape our services. And, so, and therefore I really do, do uh, I do thank uh, NAT for taking time actually over a period of time to co-produce this report with migrants who are living with HIV, who have gone through the experience of being in the UK and accessing services. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I, I welcome the discussions afterwards. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, it was it was lovely to be able to hear you articulating some of those questions, knowing that we just heard a couple of days ago, uh, speaking of kind of next stages and co-production that we've had a small grant from City Bridge Trust to be able to work with Dennis of the One Voice Network to start exploring some of the answers to some of those issues. So that is really great. And I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our final speaker, who is Laurie Hartley, whose pronouns are they, them, and who is an LGBTQI plus asylum seeker support worker at Rainbow Migration, which is the new fantastic name for the organisation formerly known as UK Lesbian and Gay Immigration Group. Um, and they provide support to lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer and intersex people through the asylum and immigration system and help asylum seekers access housing and health services. So, Laurie, I'll hand over to you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Yes, I'm Laurie. Um, so I am one of the LGBTQI plus asylum seeker support workers at Rainbow Migration. Um, queer and trans non-binary. And as you said, I use the gender pronouns they and them. Uh, but anyone who can't see me, I'm a 30 something year old white person um, with blue eyes, a short blonde quick, and a rather handsome shaved side situation. And I'm wearing a red turtleneck and I have a gold septum piercing and I'm wearing light blue headphones. My background is sort of a grey white blur. Um, so I provide one-to-one -one support to access appropriate healthcare, housing, financial support and legal representation to the people that uh, our organisation works with and I also facilitate support groups. Um, many of the people that I work with are HIV positive and um, I regularly advocate on issues that come up for them accessing um, healthcare and appropriate housing. Um, a number of those things are raised in the report. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to welcome the findings of the report. I think that all of the key findings link um, either directly or indirectly to our work and the findings that we have um, encountered with our service users. And um, I just wanted to focus on a few key areas that resonate particularly with, um, with our work. Um, so, um, yeah, to start off, I think the um, uh, the idea of ending NRPF, uh, no recourse to public funds policy, um, is incredibly welcome uh, to read. 
Um, we've definitely seen a need for this amongst all of our service users, but we would particularly say that that's the case for people who are HIV positive. Um, there are obvious additional costs for people that are HIV positive in accessing healthcare, support services, etc. And the policy at the moment prevents those people from having the additional support they should have to enable them to access those services. Um, but in, in addition to that, um, NLPF policy also has a general marked impact on people's mental health, on their other physical health care, on their emotional well-being, um, and on their ability to access social support. So um, those issues, as well as being really detrimental to a person in general and to their confidence and to their uh, general well-being, they also, um, we have noticed, um, are very likely to impact the person's uh, ability to be able to effectively prepare an asylum claim. Um, so with many of the people that we're supporting who are claiming asylum, if they do not have access to sufficient money um, or they do not have access to sufficient support, um, it's going to be a lot harder for them to, to make friends, to access support networks, to access the services that they need, which as well as impacting their well-being, um, could also provide much needed support and evidence towards their asylum claim. Um, that links in as well with the, um, the idea of not dispersing people who um, are HIV positive. And we've certainly noticed um, a lot of our uh, service users that are dispersed outside of London, as well as not having appropriate access then to ongoing healthcare treatment and that hugely impacting their, their well-being and their, um, in some cases, that, um, their treatment plan um, also can have a marked um, impact on their claim, on their asylum claim. So not just in terms of separating them from their support services that they're accessing in their support network in London, but also outside of London, there are hugely reduced LGBTQ plus services um, and hugely re reduced HIV uh, services. Um, so we're noticing that lots of the people that we're working with that are moved outside London just aren't able to access the same level of evidence that they would be able to. Um, inside London, but they're also just not able to access the same amount of support services. So that huge, has a huge impact on their mental health alongside that. Um, I would just say as well, um, in regards to the no recourse to public funds policy, um, this has become a larger concern in the wake of the new proposed immigration policy, um, in which there is the potential that that, that um, policy might be extended to people who have already received their status, who have temporary admission. We're working really hard to try and um, fight against that policy, and you can see um, our submissions on our website. Um, and there's a lot of other great organisations that are that are working really hard. Um, but that could be a huge way that that could be really detriment detrimental for lots of our HIV positive um, service users. I'll just really quickly list a couple of other things. I'm conscious about time. Um, so uh, I guess linked to that the hostile environment policy um, is the, um, the other key thing that I'd like to focus on. Um, so the idea of information sharing and the idea of not being able to access services based on people's lack of information about costings or about their fear of charges if, they, if their claim would be refused um, is a huge thing that we've noticed amongst our service users. Um, you know, I was really pleased to read that um, there were really clear findings that, um, that um, HIV uh, health tourism is a complete myth. Um, that's certainly something we've noticed in our service users. Um, many of the people that we encounter actually haven't accessed any healthcare service um, at the point when they claim asylum, where they haven't been um, documented previously or where they haven't had secure immigration status. Um, because of lack of knowledge or because of some of the barriers that have been mentioned here. Um, and, and in several cases, that's include people who have then gone on to access um, sexual and healthcare services in the UK and have been tested and have received a um, notification that they're HIV positive. Um, so that's a really direct impact of those barriers being clear. Um, I would just had um, in terms of information sharing, obviously, as, as was mentioned earlier, um, there are huge issues that come with not being able to trust um, healthcare professionals or feeling that you're not able to, to trust healthcare professionals or feeling that information that you share with a healthcare professional will be shared with the Home Office. 
Um, and this has definitely been the case with many of our service users in relation to COVID and continues to be a case in terms of people not accessing testing and treatment around HIV um, diagnoses um, for a lots of our service users. Um, so we really, really welcome um, the findings and we welcome the, um, the recommendations that have been provided. Um, I had a couple more notes, um, but I'm hoping that um, few people might raise those sorts of questions um, in the in the discussion section. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to see what comes up and uh, really pleased to hear what everyone said so far. Thank you so much, Laurie. Uh, that is really great. I'm just changing this so I can see all of our speakers back on screen again. Uh, I want to I want to start by uh, thanking all of our speakers, both for everything you said and also for your e efforts to keep to time, because that means that we've got like a really comfortable half an hour, 35 minutes. And Laurie, I hope you get to bring up some of your points in the discussion as we go on. Um, we've already got some questions that have come up into the Q&A. So thank you for people that have submitted those. Do carry on adding them to the Q&A. I'm aware, Florence, that you're um, unable to stay for the whole conversation. So I'm going to I'm going to put you on the spot and start you off with a question just to kind of kick us off. Um, and obviously other people just if, if panelists just want to kind of join in or raise their hand or whatever kind of makes the most sense. If I ask something to one person and you want to kind of comment on it as well. But um, I guess for you, Florence, I know that you've kind of advocated as part of the APPG on HIV and, and AIDS for around the action plan to meet this kind of 2030 goal of ending new HIV transmissions. Be interested to know your thoughts in terms of how the, the report from the Sewell Commission kind of might impact on that kind of where the, how those two things fit together, the Sewell Commission, sorry. How long have I got? <laughs> <laughs> I know. If you could do that in one minute, that would be good. <laughs> yeah, sure it's a simple question. I, do you know what it is, Deborah? I think it's a case of what this this report today speaks to is the lived experience, and it's something that myself and a number of people working across the field always go on about. And the fact that we had a report earlier this year, with, which, in my personal view, discounted all of that was quite shocking. And no matter how much and how many statistics the government wants to quote, we know that that inequality and, and systematic racism still exists. It's about calling a spade a spade. And until the government address that, acknowledge that, we're only gonna be tinkering around the edges. We did not need that soil report because the data already exists. We've got a fantastic House of Commons library here. It shows all the data. We've had reports by David Lammy. We've had the report on the Wendy Williams review. The data already exists. We need clear action and funding from the government to address some of this inequality and racism. And, and what I don't want to do in my role as an MP is just sit down and, and, and hear the rhetoric from the government without a clear action plan. So to all of you campaigning, working in your respective groups, it's about continuing to put that pressure on the government so that they understand the impact of reports like that has on the communities we are all working with. We are talking about real lives. We're not talking about people who are figures and quotas in, in their reports. These are real, it, it has real consequences and people are dying. So we need to look at the fact of getting the government to address that Yes, we can show that um, education rates for young BME children has improved. But why is it that then you look at mental health? Why is it that when you look at prison population? Why is it that when you look at zero hour contracts? Why is it that when you look at HIV transmissions in terms of BME and migrants coming here? It's still quite high. The data is there. So it's not about us saying we need more reports from the government. It's about addressing the inequalities and racism that we know still exists. Instead of the government bringing forward more reports, I'd want the government to invest in this action plan. I want the government to have commissioners responding. I want the government to look at how they roll out National HIV Testing Week. That's one of the key ways that we can and get people to test. I remember a figure from that Professor um, Kevin Fenton quoted, um, and it was from the Terence Higgins Trust. I think it was 77% of adults in the UK have never had a HIV test. We can beat this. We can do it. But it's only if the government listen to the experts and the people and the lived experience of people who are suffering and living with this. 
If not, we're just going to be tinkering around the edges. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask a question actually about the hostile environment because um, I think a few of you mentioned it in different ways when you were talking on the panel and we have a question that has come in the Q&A. Um, so rather than asking mine, I'll, I'll read that one out. This one is from Joel and it says, I think many people are surprised that many, over half in 2019 probably, of migrants acquired HIV in the UK after they arrived here rather than abroad. Does the panel care to comment on why they think this is? and why this is not talked about more rather than the health tourism narrative, for example. Um, who, who, wants to, who wants to go first on this? And I'll kind of open it up to anybody. Florence, do you want to? I'd be cheeky. And, and it's just coming back to no, what no. I said. Test, test, test. Some people still think that you have to pay for a HIV test. Those test kits are free. We need to get that message loud and clear. You don't need to, the stigma that's still around HIV is still prevalent amongst BME communities. We need to let people know that you can do this testing. It's just a prick on your finger. I'm petrified of needles. It's just a prick on your finger. You can do it in the comfort and security of your own home. We need to get that message loud and clear out. I think the other thing around um, testing is a thing around transmissions and people not knowing is the fact that getting people tested and making sure that actually when you, if you do then have HIV, it's not a life sentence. There's access to fantastic treatment and drugs. You can live a normal life. It's about how we challenge some of that rhetoric, unfortunately, still coming up within our churches, within some of our community groups. And hence why, for me as well, this is something that I really do want to use my position to focus on and challenge people who, in my view, are not helping people who need to come forward and, and who need that vital help and support. Another area which I think we need to focus on is this mental health stigma and associated um, stigma around that as well. There isn't enough funding for mental health services. So when people then do find out that they're suffering from HIV, they face isolation, they face um, a number of people who, who turn against them and they need that support. Mental health provision across the UK has been impacted and we need funding and specific focus on that. Thank you, Florence. Is there anyone else on the panel that wanted to kind of come in on some of those questions around why? Yes, Ravishri. Um, So totally agree with Florence. It's, it, we're not getting information on how people can test, how people can access HIV prevention tools like PrEP. Um, we're not getting them to the right people in the right way, in, in, you know, in the right language. We, our public health messaging needs to improve and we need to work more directly with communities so that they are driving the way in which this information is being spread around communities because they know best in terms of how to disseminate that information. I think the other thing is also about um, keeping people in care and on treatment. So we know that if someone is suppressed on treatment, they will not pass HIV on to anybody else. So how can we better support people from migrant communities, stay on their treatment, stay undetectable, and then not pass HIV on either. So I think there's a couple of things there as well, which need to be looked at. Thank you. I think I, I wanted to say something about sort of the this idea of, of, of people acquiring HIV in the UK rather than abroad and, and why is it not that much talked about. And 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 I guess sometimes it's because as, as migrants, we often face this thing that or or by well by others, we're sort of labeled in different ways. And it's usually with un. So we're unhealthy, we're unskilled, we're on something, and, and then that's the easiest narrative. So when you're faced with the fact that actually it might be the opposite and we and and you might have a migrant population coming into the country who is healthier than the hosting population in the country. And that's a reality that people might not want to discuss or might not want to talk about. So, so I think it's important that, yeah, that we as migrants to, to, to a certain extent, because it's quite a tiring sort of activity and a, and a tired, tiring work, but that we as migrants do fight those, those sort of bias and unfair narrative because, because we know that that's just not the reality. Thank you. And I, I really agree with you. And I think there's a real kind of challenge in terms of the, the messaging when, you know, kind of in terms of HIV as a whole, we have this kind of quite positive messaging about kind of can't pass it on and to try to encourage people to come forward to testing. And then at the same time, we're fighting against these kind of narratives around health tourism and things, which are not only damaging in and of themselves, but just are not even true. Uh, so trying to kind of balance that and then create a health system which feels kind of welcoming and accessible to people uh, is difficult. Dennis, I think you have your hand up. 
Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I think that I just want to support what Ozea said. It's around negative connotations of migrants. Uh, you know, people, I, th I don't think that there are enough conversations happening. I would love to see public health England or, um, you know, any relevant agencies trying to have some public discourse around this. You know, where we have MPs, we have policymakers, we have clinicians and public health experts. And, and, and people, you know, really getting in conversation, something like the question time, just to sensitize people, because there's so much negativity from the right-wing press, you know, and hate and xenophobia around migrants. And I think this is one of the reasons. I think the other thing is the classification um, of, of risk factors of people who are um, the prevalence of HIV. So you find that, and a public health thing that has been traditionally uh, categorizing people as gay men, and African, Black Africans. I mean, those are totally different. You know, it's, you cannot have one, you know, a category on, based on sexuality, another on, on, on color or skin or ethnicity. And I think that that needs to change. I think we need to look at people as they are. We need to be able to move away from this kind of putting people in brackets. And that's the reason why you see people from South America are just referred to as other, despite the fact that men who have sex with men from Latin America are 70% more likely to be infected by HIV once they have arrived in Europe. So there is clarity in Europe around post acquisition of HIV, post migration acquisition of HIV, which I am not seeing in the UK because if public health England were to come out strongly and make this information clearer, then maybe attitudes will change. Thank you. And I mean, at the very least, they, they provided us with the data that we're using in this report. So I should probably thank Public Health England for the extra work that it took to kind of generate that for us to be able to do that. Laurie, I can see you've got your hand up and then I'm gonna take another question. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, um, I mean, as, as we all know, um, hostile environment policy exists uh, to make life difficult for migrants living in the UK um, by treating them as less deserving of dignity and hum humanity than British citizens. And in order for that policy to work effectively, um, I guess, considering that people are coming here to access services rather than bringing much needed skills and or being forced to come to the UK. Um, yeah, it doesn't fit as well with the policy. <laughs> um, and um, as a couple of the other uh, panelists have said, it's, it's really important for us to all resist those depictions and to fight for uh, the appreciation and equal inclusion of migrant populations in the UK. Um, yeah, an obvious one, but I thought I'd add it. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. It's still important to actually kind of voice those things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us on to another question. I'll take this on because it came kind of quite early on. So uh, I feel like uh, he's been waiting a while. This is uh, Dr. Vincent Manning from CAPS, which is Catholics for AIDS Prevention and Support. And he said, thanks for the excellent presentation on this very important matter. This is probably for you, Tamara, just so you're listening, and maybe Jose. Um, a majority of people living with HIV who we serve are migrants, and we know that migrant people living with HIV often also have religious faith, and that their faith community may be their first source of support, especially for those with no recourse to public funds. And we also know that religion and faith will impact on a person living with HIV for whom faith is important, including issues of late diagnosis and adherence. So the question is, given that religion is a significant cultural factor, has your research taken account of the religious affiliation of migrants living with HIV? So yeah, and I definitely agree with Vincent that religion is a hugely important cultural factor. Um, we did ask um, everyone that we interviewed as part of our kind of data, demographic data collection, um, whether they were religious and 14 out of the 22 people that we interviewed said that they were Christian, four were Muslim, one was a spiritualist and only three said they had no religious affiliation. So I think it's a really key area to focus on in terms of what we're doing uh, next to kind of tackle HIV stigma and to improve health outcomes in this population is harnessing the, the power and the resources afforded to us by these religious affiliations. Um, and religion came up in the interviews that we did um, in a kind of variety of way. I'd say mostly when we were having discussions around HIV stigma. So, um, and it was kind of a, a, there were two kind of ways in which it was, it was raised. And one was um, around kind of actually acknowledging that public perceptions of migrants and of people living with HIV had a really negative impact on their quality of life. But a lot of people said that it was the stigma which came from their own communities, from their families, from their faith groups, which had the most devastating impact on them of being kind of cut out of their cultural life um, and that they hadn't felt necessarily very well supported by their churches. 
and their mosques. Um, but conversely, some people who, and I think this is kind of a, I mean, it's a small, a small group of people, but a, 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 maybe a pattern. The people who are more comfortable sharing their HIV status, people who were becoming activists within their communities and beyond, um, said that they'd been really well received by their churches. They were leading groups around, um, you know, improving access to testing, um, dismantling those narratives around the hostile environment that we were talking about, saying you can go to the GP, you can get testing. Um, so I definitely think that um, there's more work to be done. And one of the recommendations we make in the report is we ask that commissioners and providers um, work with local community-led organisations to ensure better co-delivery of services and um, religious groups are 100% one of those groups that we should be working with. Sorry, you've got your hand up. You're just trying to unmute yourself, sorry. Yeah, that is absolutely accidental. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, fair enough. Um, Jose, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think I think just to just to build on what Tamara was saying is I, I think the religion was an important factor throughout the whole process, just from the very beginning to reaching out to to uh, sort of faith-based organizations working in, in 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 HIV and things related to health or to LGBT rights or or, or things along those lines to 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 work with them to engage people in 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 the process of, of the of the research project and i think we also see it as part of one of the outcomes i guess when we talked about culturally specific service religion is one of those sort of we know we're not only thinking of geographical location we're thinking of of yeah of all these other sort of cultural factors that, that include religion as one of them and, and i think uh, well one thing that i'll say is we we need religious or faith organizations to be to be better resource to to do more of this work and to be able to 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 do more of what they do best, uh, yeah, in, in in a better way because it was clear from all the interviews that faith is an important matter for for many many migrants living with with HIV. Thank you. Um, I think Florence was first, and then Raghushree. Thank you, and I think a um, really really important um, point that was highlighted there. You know, some I I, I am a practicing Roman Catholic, and I think one, whether you're faith of no faith, it's about calling out um, any discrimination you see being placed against people with HIV. You know, we all have a duty as human beings to do that. And, and I think one of the things, you know, I, I don't know about CAPS, but I think one of the things that I hope that faith groups are doing is providing that peer support, is providing, um, you know, um, peer support and maybe signposting to other services within the community I think you know it's, it is really important that we look at that because for a number of people, the relationship they have with their priest and, and you know other people that they attend church with is really important, and they may help them, encouraging them to come forward in terms of testing and seeking support and advice. I think the other thing that we have to look at is the, what role the government plays in this. As part of the international community, I think it's very right for the government to call out some of the persecution we are seeing across the world by countries who, you know, if we're frankly, you know, just really bad treatment towards LGBT people and, and other people within their communities, we have to call that out. You know, I've taken part in debates, speaking, calling, calling out the persecution of Christians in Nigeria. My family background, you know, is Nigerian. I've, I've spoken against the persecution of Uyghur Muslims in Hong Kong. You know, we have to stand up for basic human rights if we are part of the, of the international community. Thank you, Ravashree. Um, so I was just gonna um, give a couple of examples on ways in which that has worked in terms of co-producing services with um, religious organizations. So I was thinking of NAS, for example, and um, just to say I am on the medical board of NAS, so before I say this, but for example, NAS did a really successful project called Testing Faith, where they trained yeah. up pastors and Muslim leaders um, to talk about HIV and HIV testing within their congregations and get people tested. Um, and also, I remember when I was working at the Homerton in Hackney, there was a church around the corner, which every Wednesday at a specific time, you could go and get a health check, and that could be your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and an HIV test. And that, again, was a really successful way of getting people in, and it didn't just talk about HIV, which I think made it more successful. And I think with COVID, we've seen so many good partnerships. So um, I work in Whitechapel, the East London Mosque in Whitechapel was doing COVID vaccinations in the mosque. So I think this is really the right time because of COVID. 
COVID to get in there and do more HIV testing work with um, religious organisations. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, read a question out from Pedro Lino. It says one of the recommendations proposed by the research was to request from the Home Office information to be provided to migrants seeking asylum, renewing their visas, etc. That to me seems like an efficient way to inform our migrant community about free sexual health services they can access. But how can we negotiate that with the Home Office? How can we convince them of informing migrants about their rights regarding sexual health? Um, Maybe, maybe I'll ask Tamara to go first on this one, uh, not to put you under pressure, but anybody else can jump in. Oh, uh, Florence, are you, are you just heading off? Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you, Florence. Um, and thank you, Pedro, for your, for your question. Um, I think, yeah, he's right. I mean, um, it is an incredibly efficient way of of communicating um, information about healthcare entitlements to migrants. And as I said, like when you arrive, when you're, if you're moving to the UK, if you're migrating to the UK, you're interacting with the Home Office. So what better place for, um, for availability to access to information? And this was actually something, um, it's contained in a report, but it was a, a quotation from someone who just said, I received so much correspondence from the Home Office when I was, and I had to report there every two weeks and I never had any information about how to access my healthcare entitlements. Um, but in terms of um, how we can engage with the Home Office um, to bring about this, I think it can be very, there's a very compelling public health argument with a condition such as HIV, which is, if everyone gets tested, you know, it's contributing to our goal of getting to zero transmissions by 2030. Um, this is part of the government's pledge to end new transmissions. And so that makes perfect sense that the more we educate and the more we um, inform people about the healthcare entitlements, the more likely they are to engage with these services and the more likely they are to achieve that goal. But I think it's really important when we have these conversations with public bodies that we don't negate the, the, the individual health argument, um, which I think sometimes um, it can be overshadowed. And I hope that this report, because it's based on so much personal testimony, allows that to come through when we are corresponding with the Home Office saying, it's not just that it's going to help you achieve your commitment and HIV transmissions, but look at the effect on these people's you know, rights to healthcare, on their human rights, on their well-being. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, it's a two-pronged approach and um, of course, like we were saying, like with all these recommendations, with consultation and involvement of people in the community with lived experience as well. Thank you. Um, that was a brilliant segue because I had a question about involving people with lived experience. It was almost like you knew Tamara. Um, so uh, this is quite a different way. I mean, we've always taken uh, the involvement of people living with HIV really seriously at National AIDS Trust, but still this was a kind of different way for us in terms of working with peer researchers right from the beginning of the project to kind of really help us think about kind of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. So I'm going to I'm gonna ask uh, Jose first of all, but I'll open it up to kind of all of you if you have anything to add, really just, I guess, to talk a bit more about that approach and why that was important and maybe, you know, who haven't we captured by this research and what we can do to address that. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll give you first kind of bite at the cherry and then see if anybody else wants to join in. Great. I, I mean, I think I think for me one of the one of the nicest things of, of, of being part of the project is that, is that it, it was a group of us. So I, so I felt that there was some representation, with, which we know it's always complicated to achieve in, in in the HIV work. And and but I think we we managed to do that by by engaging with the wider sector. That was an, also a, a very important piece of the work. Like not only working as an AT, but working with with the whole sector to to engage more migrants living with HIV in the report. Uh, and yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I think, yeah, we've, we've probably, yeah, we've probably left people behind. And I think we know that, that, that people who, who, who have insecure immigration status or, or irregular immigration status were harder to, to reach in the process. They were very reluctant to, to talk to us in any way, to share any information related to their, their immigration process or their health. Uh, so, so we know that there's more that we need to do in terms of, of, of building that, that sort of trust with, with, with people who, who are in, in difficult situations because of those hostile environment policies that, that we've been discussing or because of simply being in the, in the country uh, without a permission to be in the country. So, so I think those were particularly the, the people that I, that I noticed 
that it was harder to to engage in the service. We had conversations with many of them, but many of them weren't keen to to come forward and share their stories. Uh, so yeah, it's just thinking what can, what else can we do to 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 engage them in in that process. Thank you. Anyone else on this one? Yeah, so, so, um, Dennis, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to um so add to that. Um, I know that of course you know the report cannot cover everyone, but um there are also um issues that we need to look at. For example, we've talked about HIV and aging in the context of migrants, so people who are of a migration background, and 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 what like the concept of quality of life is of 490 is you know um, as people age with HIV, and so. I think that the levels of literacy around how to manage uh, conditions that are long-term, which are associated with HIV is still very low. And I think that we need to address something around health literacy. But I also feel that uh, you know, communities are very res resilient and uh, we have not provided enough opportunities to develop expert patients who can support because our experience of the community is that you know, people support one another. You, know, you don't even have to prescribe as long as they feel confident and empowered and supported in some way. And they're also recognized, they're very, very happy to give their time. So I feel that we need to be able to look at models that build community resilience and maximize the social capital we have within the HIV patient community so that people can feel proud and good about, you know, sharing their experiences and supporting each other. Thank you. Raghashree. Um, mine is just a little plea to NAT to maybe write something about how they carried out the research, because I think you guys have probably done stuff that we could all learn from. And thinking about, for example, compensating participants for their time and thinking about how that goes in terms of what they're, how much they're allowed to receive and employment and all that kind of thing, I think it would be really useful for future research to know what you guys have learned. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And we, I, there's definitely a lot we kind of learned in kind of how we did this. I'm sure we'd be happy to share with the sector. And I should also do a plug because I saw a little comment come up earlier uh, for Trust for London, who funded this project and who I know have been really kind of working hard to make sure that this type of approach is integrated into lots of the projects they're funding. And I know that they have some resources as well. So um, we can kind of share that. And then that's kind of learning from outside of the HIV sector as well. God forbid that we should look outside as well as inside. Um, OK, I'm going to warn you what we're going to do. I've got, uh, I've got one more question that I'm, oh, I'm going to come to Laurie uh, because they have their hand up. Um, and then I'm going to do uh, one more one more specific question from the Q&A and then I'm going to read out Alib's question because it's the perfect closing question to give you all a chance to kind of make some final comments just uh, as we kind of get towards the end. So uh, Laurie, you first. Great, thank you. Yeah, it was purposeful this time. Um, so uh, I just wanted to add that, yeah, we really support this um, research model and um, just wanted to echo the importance of noticing um, I guess what voices haven't been included and why that might be and notice that they there is an inclusion of people from refugee communities which is great but um obviously it's already been mentioned that people without secure uh, migration status there isn't a huge representation and that includes people seeking asylum um, and i think that we start to see a sort of clearer and more nuanced idea of some of the barriers facing those people if we were able to reach out to them and I totally agree that it is harder to reach out for, for the reasons, the same reasons as of a lot of the barriers that have been noticed. Um, but yeah, I'd really like to, to um, see an extension into those communities and try and include them more, more in future research. Um, with that in mind, I sort of wanted to also echo that it, um, the importance of trying to compensate people where possible, um, whether that's through vouchers or things if you aren't able to um, provide uh, cash or, or monetary compensation um, just as a way to sort of support people as well and acknowledge the, um, their labour. Um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a question from Rosie Hayes, um, which is, was Brexit raised at all during your discussions? I'm wondering if it's created barriers to access to healthcare or raised fears of barriers, and if it was raised, was it only by EU migrants or also non-EU migrants? Who wants to? Tamara? I can answer. Um, so uh, it was it did come up. Um, it wasn't something. So we had like a semi structured interview guide, and we didn't have a question specifically around Brexit. Um, interestingly, well, it came up with among people that we interviewed from the EU. Um, 
but fortunately they had applied for um, free settled status, which the deadline is fast approaching. So if you have not applied yet, please do. Um, but they were kind of like saying that in a kind of reassuring way of like, oh, well, you know, I've managed to secure pre settled status and my healthcare entitlements aren't going to change. It did come up with um, people from outside the EU. And I think this speaks to something that a lot of people in the kind of migrant and healthcare sectors are very fearful of, which is um, these hostile environment policies, you know, charging for healthcare um, being. Uh, expanded into primary care, um, for example. So someone raised specifically around fears around Brexit, saying, I'm really worried that this means that my HIV treatment will no longer be free. Um, it did, so it did come up. And I think had the kind of research been conducted at a slightly later date, um, we would have probably got quite a different picture because obviously people who've arrived to stay for more than six months since the 1st of January aren't entitled to those same healthcare um, benefits that um, we that EU migrants have been before. Um, so I think definitely in terms of when we're thinking about what we're doing next with the project, the resources that we're that we're producing and who we're working with, um, EU migrants are a really big demographic that we'll need to engage. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> Alid asked, uh, what's next for this project following on from the publishing of this report and how can we ensure the recommendations get implemented? So. Like I'm going to come last to you tomorrow. Maybe you can talk a bit about what's next from the point of view of National AIDS Trust. Um, but I just thought maybe it'd be great to go around the panel and just give you each a chance to kind of say something about kind of what you think from your perspective needs to come next. And also a final chance if there was anything you were hoping to get a chance to say this afternoon that you haven't had a chance, give you your opportunity to do that uh, in our five or final five minutes. Does anybody want to volunteer to go first or will I just pick on a person? Um, okay, I'm gonna go with Jose first. <laughs> Just Great. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, I think thank you for that question, Ale. I think the, the first thing that come to my mind is working with 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 everyone here in the call, but with everyone in the sector, working together not only with with sort of the people that we usually work with in the HIV sector, but also like wider migrant uh, network organizations who are very keen to to sort of work with us in, in this matter. So so I think, yeah, just, just sort of pushing and doing advocacy to, to try to achieve some of these recommendations is one of them, but also using them to, to empower the, the migrants living with HIV that we work with uh, to, to, to be better sort of patient advocates, to advocate for themselves and to advocate for their community. So, so that's kind of what comes to my mind. Thank you. Laurie, do you want to come next? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I echo that. Um, I think um, I'd really like to see more information sharing, uh, more training and working together amongst our various organisations. And um, yeah, more, I guess more active work to reach out to our collective communities, uh, so that the people that we work with um, and that we represent are able to represent themselves and, and speak with their own voices. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to see what we can all achieve together. Dennis? Well, so I think that this report is a very good start. It gives us the basis for arguments. And I think that uh, I would like to see actually a seriously constituted working group that may involve members of the APPG, uh, the National Institute for Health Protection, the charities, to start working on some of the issues that we have highlighted, that have been highlighted in this report. I mean, not usually you find that, you know, agencies and organizations like NAT lead the way around arguments as to why you should provide everyone with PrEP. And, and then, you know, there's always more, almost a passive kind of approach on the part of commissioners, on the part of, you know, national health bodies. So I would like to see some seriousness around restructuring services within, I mean, to make them more integrated, more welcoming, to address cultural um, competencies uh, and to, to, to look at you know, some of the solutions around why um, migrants, for example, are being diagnosed late and are being diagnosed mostly in clinical, I mean, in emergency settings. So I, I would like to see some action. And I think that is a good opportunity for us to work with NAT going forward with the funding that we received from City Bridge Trust to start putting some of that in place. Great, thank you, Dennis. Raghashree. 
Um, so I think as HIV clinicians, we should be making our services more in reach, more friendly to migrants. So as Dennis said, in terms of cultural competency, but also structural competency. So thinking about structures that affect our patients' ability to engage in healthy um, behaviours and healthcare. Um, we need to make sure our staff are trained on what people are entitled to. So, so we're giving them the right information, making sure we have things in the right languages. Um, and I think importantly I think that we should be advocating not just for our patients but patients overall so for example joining campaigns such as patients not passports we'll think about healthcare in the wider sense thank you and Tamara thank you so um yeah in terms of what is next for this report I'm very excited by all the suggestions and all the ideas that all the other panelists have had because I definitely think um it's yeah, 100% true. And I especially love Dennis's commitment to the working group idea, um, which uh, we will definitely be pursuing. Um, I think um, the next stage of this project, as well as campaigning for the implementation of these recommendations, is also going to be to be for producing resources for migrants, um, for people born abroad. And um, we're going to be leading a focus group in partnership with NAS project. Um, in order to kind of inform that work like what does that look like what does migrant-led advocacy in the context of these recommendations look like for you and how can we produce resources that um, meet those needs because I mean this report um, I think like Dennis said it's a great start it's ultimately not aimed it's aimed at the people we're trying to influence it's not aimed at the people with lived experience who who need really quite urgent changes to the system in order to um, improve their health outcomes. So as well as campaigning for these recommendations, we're hoping to be producing some resources for those people as well. Great, thank you so much. And um, so, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, draw us to a bit of a close. I can't believe we're gonna finish on time. This is very impressive, for National AIDS Trust. Uh, we've absolutely heard really clearly today, the case for change. Um, and we know, you know, in terms of policy in term and the next steps, we need to make sure that the HIV action plan specifically focuses on people born abroad. We need decision makers and health systems to make urgent progress to ensure some of these barriers are removed and that supports in place to improve the quality of life for migrants living with HIV so that we can um, get new HIV transmissions. You can find the full report. Um, I know it's probably very difficult always to represent a, a kind of 18 month long report in a 10 minute presentation. So I'd urge you all to take some time to have a look at it. And um, it's on our website, it should be really easy to find, but there's also a link to it in the chat. Um, I wanna once again, thank Trust for London um, for funding this work um, and to everybody who took part in the research and particularly thank you so much panelists for helping us to launch this and sharing your time and your expertise and making this such an interesting and rich conversation. Thanks to everybody for attending today. Um, we've heard a really clear message from migrants living with HIV that more needs to be done and that we can't leave any group behind in our response to HIV in the UK. So I guess my final thing is the commitment from National AIDS Trust to make sure that we will continue doggedly to work in the way that we do to get our recommendations implemented. But we won't be able to do that without your support and help. So please do stay in touch. And thank you all so much for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.